Item number SCP-1602. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures, as it only exhibits anomalous qualities when spread out, SCP-1602 must remain folded a minimum of five times when not undergoing testing. When SCP-1602 is removed from its container to undergo testing or cleaning, no fewer than three personnel are to be in a room with it at any given time. It is currently kept at storage site 49 inside a standard containment locker. Researchers seeking to conduct additional tests involving SCP-1602 must have written approval from a level 3 staff member before removing the item from containment. Instances of SCP-1602-B are to be terminated by security personnel after research staff has made sufficient notes regarding its behavior. All remains are to be preserved and placed in storage. Description SCP-1602 is a plastic shower curtain patterned with stylized sea turtles. When it is spread and placed in a room with a single human subject, SCP-1602 will enter its active state. After activation, an extra-dimensional space containing SCP-1602-A will be generated behind SCP-1602. This phenomenon will still occur even when SCP-1602 is placed against a wall or other solid object. 5 to 30 minutes after activation, a faint light will appear roughly 3M behind SCP-1602, casting a silhouette of SCP-1602-A on the back of the curtain. SCP-1602-A will remain stationary for a brief period before drawing back SCP-1602 and approaching the subject. Pre-test counseling sessions conducted with D-class subjects have shown that instances of SCP-1602-A take on forms that are representative of the subject's psychological insecurities, see experiment log. If an additional party enters the room during this process, SCP-1602-A and any traces of its existence will instantly vanish and SCP-1602 will re-enter its dormant state. If left unimpeded, SCP-1602-A will restrain the subject and forcibly pull them behind SCP-1602. Instances of SCP-1602-A have consistently proven capable of outrunning, overpowering, and subduing subjects through non-lethal means. Once the subject has been taken behind SCP-1602, SCP-1602-A will return SCP-1602 to its spread position. SCP-1602 will then re-enter its dormant state, resulting in the disappearance of SCP-1602-A and the captured subject. In roughly 10% of tests conducted with D-class personnel, the captured subject re-emerged from behind SCP-1602 unharmed and with no memory of their abduction. In the remaining tests, SCP-1602 spontaneously reactivated 10 to 60 minutes after the subject's disappearance and an instance of SCP-1602-B was generated. SCP-1602-B appears identical to the most recent version of SCP-1602-A, however, they will not disappear when viewed by a person other than the subject. SCP-1602-B can be easily terminated with a standard firearm, even when SCP-1602-B possesses no visible means of animation. SCP-1602 was retrieved on 13-08-1988 from a hotel in, South Dakota. During the initial containment mission, Foundation field agents discovered an instance of SCP-1602-B inside a hotel room and presumed it to be an independent anomaly. The instance of SCP-1602-B was designated SCP and the mission was filed as a success. When Foundation Intelligence intercepted a second report of a monster at the same hotel, a more thorough examination of the building was initiated and SCP-1602 was contained. Experiment Log Test 1602-5 Subject, D-1602-5, a Caucasian male, age 20. During conversations with on-site counselor DR, subject confessed that he that had coerced his girlfriend into having an abortion. Subject expressed profound feelings of regret surrounding this event. Procedure, SCP-1602 hung on a plastic shower rod suspended from the ceiling in the middle of the test chamber. Subject was instructed walk around SCP-1602 and view the other side once it entered an active state. Results. 
SCP-1602 entered an active state after approximately 5 minutes, consistent with activation time in previous tests. The subject noticed a faint light emanating from behind SCP-1602 and walked around to view the other side. Subject reported that upon viewing the other side, SCP-1602 apparently re-entered its dormant state, the light vanished and was no longer visible from either side of SCP-1602. No other anomalous activity reported. Test 1602-6 Subject, D-1602-5, same as previous test. Procedure, SCP-1602 hung on a plastic shower rod suspended from the ceiling in the middle of the test chamber. Subject was instructed to stand in place and observe only one side of SCP-1602. Results, SCP-1602 again entered an active state after approximately 5 minutes. 10 minutes and 23 seconds into the test, a small, undefined silhouette appeared at the base of the curtain. An instance of SCP-1602-A, SCP-1602-A6, emerged precisely 3 minutes later, taking the form of a newly born child covered in vernix caseosa and blood. SCP-1602-A6 crawled out from beneath the curtain in the direction of the subject. Upon observing SCP-1602-A6, the subject screamed and stumbled backward, losing balance and collapsing on the floor. Several hundred additional instances of SCP-1602-A6 continued to emerge, many of these were identical to the original instance, although 22% of duplicates still bore umbilical cords. Acting as a group, SCP-1602-A6 converged on the subject. Subject fought back but was overpowered by SCP-1602-A6 and was subsequently dragged behind the curtain, followed by all remaining SCP-1602-A6. A single instance of SCP-1602-B6 emerged after 15 minutes. Autopsy confirmed that its anatomy was consistent with that of a typical infant, although its internal organs were found filled with live maggots. Samples of the maggots were preserved and placed in storage. Additional, any traces of vernix caseosa and blood left on the floor by SCP-1602-A6 ceased to exist the moment research staff entered the room. Note. The presence of multiple instances of SCP-1602-A at one time suggests that SCP-1602-A are entities generated each time SCP-1602 enters an active state, rather than a single entity that assumes different forms, as had been previously theorized. Dr. Lindquist Test 1602-7 Subject, D-1602-6, a Hispanic female, age 33 Subject had a history of bulimia and self-image disorders. Procedure, SCP-1602 placed in a spread position against the wall of the test chamber with a mild adhesive. Results, subject exhibited high levels of anxiety and panic upon SCP-1602 entering its active state, repeating the phrase, I can't do this. This pattern of behavior continued until SCP-1602-A7 appeared behind SCP-1602, at which point subject began banging on the wall opposite to SCP-1602 while shouting incoherently. SCP-1602-A7 pulled back the curtain, revealing a cavity in the wall that had not previously existed. SCP-1602-A7 was identical to the subject in height and race, but appeared to possess no muscular tissue whatsoever, with skin stretched directly over its bones and ligaments. Lack of musculature notwithstanding, SCP-1602-A7 still possessed a high level of mobility and strength, grabbing the subject by the ankles and pulling the subject behind the curtain. An instance of SCP-1602-B5 emerged within five minutes of the subject's disappearance. SCP-1602-B5 was observed to claw at its own body, its jaw fully extended but making no vocalizations. Researchers called for termination after four minutes of observation. Autopsy deemed unnecessary as SCP-1602-B5 had peeled back most of its own skin, confirming its lack of muscle tissue. Retrieval of SCP-1602 showed the wall to be in the same condition as it had been at the beginning of the test. Test 1602-8 Subject, 
D1602-7, a Caucasian male, age 58. Subject had been a high-ranking employee of a Fortune 500 company prior to incarceration. DR, who provided counseling for the subject in the weeks prior to testing, noted that the subject expressed significant frustration over the fact that his dedication to his work had led to his estrangement with his children and ex-wife. Procedure, SCP-1602 placed on the floor in a spread position. Results, SCP-1602's horizontal orientation did not appear to alter its effects, activating within the standard time frame. SCP-1602-A8 emerged from beneath it, climbing from a perfectly round hole in the floor that had not existed prior to SCP-1602's activation. SCP-1602-A8 took the form of a clown in a loose, polka-dotted suit. While its body seemed to be that of a natural human, its head was disproportionately large and made from what appeared to be papier-mâché, with areas of the face cut out where its eyes would typically be located. A reflective substance, later confirmed to be standard confetti, poured continuously from these orifices for the entire duration of the test. This test marks the first time an instance of SCP-1602-A has made vocalizations, despite its lack of visible means of articulation. SCP-1602-A8 approached the subject very slowly, repeatedly expressing a desire to play and encouraging the subject to loosen up and live a little. Subject attempted to engage SCP-1602-A8 in conversation, making numerous inquiries about its nature, albeit with a significant amount of profanity. 34 minutes after the subject's capture, SCP-1602-B8 was generated and proceeded to stumble around the room in a state of extreme distress. Like SCP-1602-A8, it made numerous vocalizations, though most of its statements were requests to see Dr. Lindquist and questions regarding its own nature. The following is the subsequent exchange between SCP-1602-B8 and Dr. Lindquist. Begin log. Dr. Lindquist, we'll start by confirming your identity. What is your name? SCP-1602-B8, confetti still pouring from its facial orifices, redacted. Dr. Lindquist, what are the names of your children? SCP-1602-B8, redacted. What's happened to me? Dr. Lindquist, please remain calm and answer the questions. Do you have any pets? SCP-1602-B8, I have a great Dane named Dorothy. Please, doctor, I need help, I'm blind and... Dr. Lindquist, what did you see after you were taken behind the curtain? SCP-1602-B8, I didn't see anything. What's happened to my face? Why am I blind? What did that expletive redacted clown do to me? Dr. Lindquist, that's what we're trying to figure out. We want to help you, but you need to answer our questions. Did SCP-1602-A8 say anything to you after? SCP-1602-B8, you let that thing do this to me. For the love of God, Doctor, what's it done to me? Why can't I see anything? Why is everything so cold? Why does my head feel so? SCP-1602-B8 raises its hands to its face and makes vocalization similar to weeping. Dr. Lindquist, please try to remain calm. I only have a few more questions. SCP-1602-B8, still weeping, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. End log. Closing statement. SCP-1602-B8 refused to respond to any further questioning and was terminated shortly after interview. It is unknown if D-1602-8 was physically transmuted into SCP-1602-B8, if the subject's consciousness was transferred, or if SCP-1602-B8 was impersonating the subject. Much of the confetti produced by SCP-1602-B8 was incinerated, with a small amount stored in a small plastic container and placed in storage. Test 1602 to 18. Subject, D1602-21, an African American male, age 46. Subject was uncooperative in counseling sessions, but was found to have a history of impoverishment.
Procedure, subject given a standard firearm and placed in a bulletproof testing chamber with SCP-1602. Results, SCP-1602-A took the form of an The subject fired several rounds of ammunition which had no visible effect on SCP-1602-A. The subject was apprehended, as expected. No activity was detected from SCP-1602 for two hours, after which the subject re-emerged, apparently unharmed and visibly damp. When interviewed, the subject claimed that he had not been abducted, and had in fact simply taken a shower, describing the experience as pleasant and cleansing. Testing is ongoing.